He goes to the scholar, he says to him, I've killed a hundred, can Allah forgive me? Now look at the difference between when you ask, you know the guy in the mosque, you know the guy with the big beard? When you ask him and you ask Alim, he says to the man, and who can stand between you and Tawbah? Who? Now we're talking, the man's thinking, now we're talking, I like this thing. He says to him, for you to make Tawbah, you got to leave this environment. It's a very bad environment and the people, they're not helping you in doing good. There is a town, there is an area, go there, there are good people. These people will help you worship Allah and they will help you pull up and change. So the man was sincere. He packs his stuff and heads off to the town. On the way, death meets him, he dies. So the angels of forgiveness come down and the angels of punishment come down. And there's an argument. The angels of mercy said, but he made Tawbah. The angels of punishment said, no, no, no. He killed a hundred people and he didn't complete his Tawbah. He was on the way. So Allah sends down a third to be a judge between them. The angel says, measure the distance. If he is closer to the town of sin, then let the angels of punishment take him. But if he is closer to the town of forgiveness, then let the angels of mercy take him. So they measured the earth and unfortunately for him, he was closer to the town of sin. Authentic hadith in Bukhari, Allah ordered the earth to change its dimensions and made him one hand span closer to the town of... At the moment, but alhamdulillah, we're actually joined by a special guest in the cave today. Um, before we jump straight into it, I'd just like to let our audience know that you can actually support this podcast if you go on Patreon. So just check out patreon.com slash boys in the cave. But today we're actually joined by a dear brother, uh, Muhammad Hoblos, speaker die in the community and obviously worldwide. People will know him through, you know, YouTube, our favorite platform, Alhamdulillah. So, um, assalamu alaikum, brother Muhammad Hoblos, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and assalamu alaikum to all the brothers and sisters that are tuning in. Thank you guys for having me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you all. SubhanAllah, like, um, Jazakallah khair for coming out, you know, this way. We know it's like, you made a joke about it when I was messaging you about, like, should I bring my passport along? But Alhamdulillah, <laughs> like, I'm glad you, you made it this way. <laughs> I didn't know Muslims live this far out in sydney so <laughs> it's good to see yeah like even in um that's why they actually started green square masjid like a dear brother um ahmed um because a lot of like there's a lot of bengali muslims out here as well um probably not from i don't know they've always lacked a, a kind of communal aspect so i guess we yeah, made green it. square i mean how far do you have to travel to get a zatar manush here man <laughs> <laughs> hey? up the m5 probably like 20 minutes side yeah. You know what it is. Yeah. But alhamdulillah. Like, um, I wanted to ask you actually a um, specific <coughs> question in regards to your Facebook page. Because I remember um, Steve Dublis, um, you did a live stream with him. Like, this was like a couple of months back. And you mentioned um, you actually don't have any Facebook accounts like dedicated to you. And all the ones that are actually out there are more just fake accounts yeah is that is that correct like to kind of clarify there's like there's like four or five uh Muhammad Hoblos Facebook accounts with your photo that, that yeah. aren't actually yours yeah <laughs> yeah well uh <laughs> we've started by touching a nerve right away so nah look um yeah I don't have anything I don't have any social media what are your honest. kind of thoughts on social media I always like to ask you know people in our community this question um wow look I think social media is definitely a platform that's undeniable. It's there. It's extremely powerful. It's used. Um, you know, it's the modern. It's the modern age. It's how people communicate. Um, but I want to separate myself now from shara and halal and haram. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong or halal or haram. All that I'm saying is that for myself personally. That's not a path that I want to take. So, I mean, I do use the, sh I mean, I use the social network platform um, where a lot of the videos are shared and used. But I myself personally, I don't have any, anything to do with social networks. I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have uh, like a Snapchat or, a, or an Instagram. Um, I don't have any of those mediums, no. 
I think YouTube is one of the the big ones to you know being able to disseminate videos around the world. It was actually a very interesting story. Um, I had a friend from Belgium, and they came here, and they they started linking me videos, and they said, "Oh, my my favorite uh, Sudani lives in Australia," and uh, he, he kept sending me, "He's like, oh, I like this this Greek sheikh," and he sent me, and I, I saw, uh, you know, it's you, Mr. Mohammed Hoblos. So <laughs> I've always I think thought of you as, as the Greek as the Greek sheikh, and I, I, <laughs> remember, Greek sheikh. I remember coming and being like, oh, "I'm pretty sure he's Lebanese," you know. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's the surname. It's the but Hoblos yeah, that so sort of. But apparently, people yeah, people people can can. Uh, benefit from your videos, alhamdulillah, in places even like Belgium and yeah. and and in in northern Europe as well. So I think, in terms of that ability to reach, because that's something that we haven't really had in the past. And yeah, uh, <coughs> look again, um, uh, it's a great way to communicate. You know, it's it's a fine line, and again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, and I'm not saying it's halal, it's haram. But uh, you know, I do my best to avoid social media because. You know, it's about the message, not about the individual. Um, so I don't look at myself as a. Actually, I'm not. I mean, I'm not a sheikh. I'm not a alim. I'm not a scholar of any by any means. I'm not a, a learned man by any means. Um, I'm just a regular brother who, who loves his deen and and you know I love to speak about Allah in the best way that I know how. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it stops there, and um, I don't believe. Because unfortunately, what I do see happening is Dean and Dawa is taking this celebrity, <coughs> excuse me, you know, this uh, celebrity status where it's about followings. You know, I follow this person and I follow that person, and and you know, I mean, I know internally that it gets to the brothers. You know, how many likes do you have, and how many? And Allahu Alam, I think, I think that. It hurts the message. It hurts it because, you know, this deen is not about individuals. It's not about praising individuals. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. We're all fallible. We're, we're you know, it's about Allah and His Prophet and this deen. You know, it's not about glorifying individuals. Exactly. So that's, you know, I mean, I do my best to avoid social media. And, I mean, of course, it opens, you know, it opens other doors. Uh, fitna, you know. Um, now you've got private access. People can, you know, what's the term? DM you, is it? <laughs> yeah. DM. Well, what's what's yeah? What's DM. DM. That's, that's uh, direct message. Direct message, right? So, so you know, so now I'm at home, and you know, I can have a DM from anyone, male, <laughs> female, anywhere around the world. Well, um, and of course, I mean, you know, it falls under. Oh, it's all for the sake of Allah and. Come on, man, who are you kidding? You know, I mean, I know myself, I know my weaknesses. And if I've got sisters that are DMing me privately, mate, honestly, I'll be clean shaven by the end of the week. No. So, yeah, I don't want to know about it, to be honest. I want to stay away from it as much as possible. Um, because you yourself, you're pretty unique position where you say, you know, you don't obviously have your own kind of social media, but, you know, you're very much, you know, shared and your videos get shared and viral on YouTube, all that sort of stuff. So how did you initially get started on that front? Because, you know, usually for videos to go viral, you need like a big platform and you need to upload the video and stuff. But not, not specifically about the videos, but also like how did you even come into giving down one and speaking about the Dean on these kinds of platforms? Um, look, I, I, I came into it, I mean, it was never planned. You know, it's not something I woke up one day and decided, oh, you know, I want to be a speaker. Um, you know, I mean, I'm an electrician by trade, so that's what I do for a living. But I'll tell you what did happen. Um, when I, <clears throat> so what would happen was like, I was going to a lot of Friday khutbahs uh, and I would hear great talks. And I would hear great talks, sorry, not great talks. I would hear great content but delivered very poorly. And I remember sitting there listening, and I'm thinking, man, had you just said it like this, it would have been a lot more effective. Or had you not said this and said, you know, so, so I mean, I would listen to the Mashaykh or to whoever was speaking, you know, and I'll think, man, you, you, you're throwing out gold here, but, but, you know, only if it was packaged differently. And so then sort of slowly, whenever I would get a chance or someone would tell me, you know, do you want to say a couple of words? Um, you know, like I'd be passionate. And of course, I love my dean. 
I love Allah. I love speaking about Deen. I think it's the best topic in the world. It's it's you know it, it's just it's the best. It's the greatest. There's nothing better to talk about. Um, and then just slowly, slowly. I mean, you know, I would give talks, and uh, the UMA was a great platform for me. Um, you know, Sheikh Shadi, may Allah subhanahu wa taala reward him. He would allow me to get up at the camps and give a talk, and and then it sort of just snowballed from there. So. You know, you make camps, and then it became a khutbah here and a khutbah there, and a funeral here and a funeral there, and and it's sort of just. But it's not something I ever intended. I mean, I never woke up thinking, "Yeah, this is what I want to do." And I guess it's unique where now I get um I've seen like you flew out to UK um to do talks there, if yeah. I remember. So, how's the journey been for you so far in regards to Look, Darwin I, itself? I, you know how they always say all praise is due to Allah and all thanks is to Him. Wallahi, I've been showered with blessings that I don't deserve, but Allah gave them to me, so I thank Him for it. Wallahi, alhamdulillah. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, you know, I've traveled the world. I've met Muslims in all... It's just the best, man. Like, I, 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 <laughs> I can't hide that. It's been amazing. Wallahi, alhamdulillah. Um, if I had to ask you, like, what's been your most memorable moment in uh, Darwin? Oh, don't ask me that. No. <laughs> what's been my most memorable moment, like, or a, a memory you cherish um, whilst doing Dawah? You know, it could be bumping into someone that you've looked up to, um, a, a Muslim bloke you've looked up to when you're young, or anything like that. Um, well, you're really picking at me now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's been many. Uh, nothing specifically comes to my mind right now, but um, I th- yeah, just many things like traveling the world. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to go to go to Saudi, to Mecca and Medina multiple times, and that's been a great honor. I think that's been an, like that's been awesome. Um, taking brothers with me when I go to these places, sharing my experiences with them there. And seeing their reactions, seeing their faces, seeing it's it's gold. Yeah. And even um, you know, I'll, we're kind of focusing more on your experiences, you know, in the Dawa. What's been your experience? Because you're born in bred you know in Sydney, right? Right. Yeah. So how's your experiences been like growing up in Sydney? Because for us, um, you know, the reason why we started Boys in the Cave is that we had different experiences growing up, and we felt that a lot of the stuff that we had to face like you know me um going into science class and then getting hit with theory evolution and then you're fighting with your iman straight away you know what i mean like we've had kind of different experiences me and rafael well, I've, I've had a very different experience yeah, rafael's <laughs> a reaver alhamdulillah so that's are what, you a reaver yes I, I everyone just assumes i'm syrian or lebanese <laughs> where, where are you from italian. what's your background italian mostly yeah italian yeah. is that where the good looks come from <laughs> oh, well, i don't know about whose ferrari was that parked outside <laughs> 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 But uh, you know what I mean, like um, Rafa. We did an episode with him. We um, touched on how he's had different, you know, battles when he, you know, became Muslim. So we've had kind of unique experiences. That's why we share them on Boys in the Cave. But um, I guess even for yourself, it might be a bit different. But what's been your experience in? Particular yeah, what's the kind of main kind, of, you know, experiences you've had of your upbringing in Sydney and the Muslim community and how it's kind of also changed as well? I, I want to ask you about that. I don't see my upbringing to be anything unique or special. Um, I relate to, I mean, most Lebanese, <coughs> most Lebanese Muslims, I think we all come from a pretty similar. Look, alhamdulillah, I came from a very good home, you know, very loving mum and dad and who did their best. I mean, it wasn't the most overly religious family, but they did their best, you know, so there was some deen to some extent. Um, I always knew that I was Muslim from when I was young. But I guess like anyone um, in my age, growing up and the schools we went to and hanging out with the boys that I was hanging out with, um, deen wasn't the most important thing to us. It was all about um, you know, living life and trying to make a name for yourself and trying to get ahead and try to fit in with everyone and yeah, like, uh, it's not a special journey. There's, there's, you know, I mean, I'm just thankful to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked me up at an early age. You know, um, but my upbringing, 
I feel has played a big role in my dawah. In that, look, I believe the most effective da'is and mashayikh are the ones that are homegrown because they know the people, they know the situation, they know the circumstances, right? So they can relate. And uh, Allahu Alam, I think that's, that's um, one of my benefits is that when I speak to my audience, when I speak to people, I don't have to convince them. I know their lives. I know what they're living through. I know what they're going through, sorry, you know. And um, and I think I can relate that back to Dean. And so it helps. I think for our international listeners, because we have quite a few listeners overseas in places, especially like the US, there there aren't a great deal of shuk. And this is not a criticism of the shuk uh, in, in Sydney, but there aren't a great deal of shuk in the area that have really their finger deeply on the pulse. There's also probably could argue not enough of them in general, mm. but that have their finger. But I, I've, I remember watching your videos, even probably before I was Muslim, about the, you know, there's no Muslim gangsters and uh, the videos on mental health that you, that you, you did, that was quite recent, um, about phenomena such as, you know, lying to the government in Centrelink and these these kinds of things, you know, that, that are occurring, unfortunately, within, uh, within the Muslim community. So... I wonder, what do you think of how the community, like what sort of direction is it heading and, and what sort of direction are the leaders heading to deal with these issues and what do you think is the best way to deal with these issues uh, coming from a homegrown day? Yeah, this is, um, this is a bit of a tough one. Look, my personal approach is You know, how do I say this in the most politically correct way? I know we're in deep, very deep. And I don't have the time nor the luxury to sit down and worry about what people think about me and how I look and the way I'm doing things. The way I look at it is we're drowning, this ummah is drowning and we need help. So, you know, forgive me if I'm a bit loud and forgive me if I'm a bit rough around the edges. We need help. We need a lot of help. So, and we have to do what we need to do to help. Now, I think different mashayikh come from different backgrounds, different upbringings, and that plays a big role. Um, And, you know, to be fair to them, sometimes I feel like we ask too much from the mashayikh. You know, what are their roles? You know, like how do we define the role of a sheikh? Because there are people that I talk to and they really believe that Mashaykh are like angels who have these superpowers and can do, you know, that you go to the Sheikh for everything. You go to him when you're sick, you go to him when you need help, you go to him when you have problems, you go to him when you need to be inspired, you go to him when you're down, you go to, you know, I mean, he's a human being who's very limited in his knowledge and he only has so many tools that he can help you with. You know, what are we asking of them? Um, <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, as far as the Dawa and where is it heading, Look, I see a lot of positive things and I see a lot of good changes. And then I also see a lot of negative. I sometimes feel, you know, like sometimes you work hard and you feel like, you know what, we're finally moving forward. You know, it's like you take one step back and then I'll see something, then I see, oh, <laughs> we haven't moved an inch. We're actually going backwards. Um, <clears throat> but I think people need to be a lot more realistic. Um, you know, I would love, love for Mashaykh, Ulama, whoever it is. To be on the ground, to be on the ground, because there's a big, big gap between the books and what's happening outside on the road, you know, what's happening outside on the streets, what's happening in people's homes, in people's businesses, in workplaces, you know, there's a massive gap. So you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you cannot relate to the people that you're talking to, then what good is it? You know, and that and that was one of the most unique things about the Prophet Wasallam was that anyone who sat in front of him could relate to him. You know, he was from, he was from the ordinary people. So the poor man could come to him and feel comfortable. And the elite, you know, and the statesmen and the, and the, and the you know, and the elite of their people could also come to him and sit and talk to him and relate. So he was very, very unique in that sense. A lot of <coughs> stories even from Christian writers this is really interesting you mentioned that because I was reading Edward Gibbon um, talking about the first four Khulafa and he actually wrote about Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, anhu, and he said that this man was one of the greatest generals who ever lived and one of the greatest statesmen who ever lived 
But one day there was a Persian uh, emissary who came to find, you know, the caliph of the Muslims, and they found him asleep with the poor people on the steps of the masjid. And so it's really kind of uh, highlights the, the kind of sunnah and the way that Muslims are supposed to be living in that we are meant to be, no matter how who you are, no matter how much knowledge you have, it is so important to be on the ground with the people and, and relating to the people and, and kind of helping them in the way that they need to be helped. Well, I mean, th- there's, um, there's a very nice hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the Sayyid of the people is the Khadim, you know, that, that the leader of the people is the one who serves his people, you know, is one that's on the ground and helping out, and and uh, look, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done. You bring up um, a good point. You mentioned, you know, businesses and families being in a mess, and you know, the more you kind of engage with the Muslim community, you realize, you know, there's a lot of marriage workshops now because for the fact that you know there's so many issues in in households, you know, whether it could be abuse or, you know, tr- children's not treating their parents right or vice versa. Um, and then you see business malpractices by Muslims. And because I do like side business, but not from Muslims, but you just see malpractice everywhere. You see injustice everywhere. And it's just like every facet. We've just not really shown that we 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 are, you know, uphold or we are, following the sunnah to the T, you know, and I think it, what would you say then would be the responsibility for just, you know, a lay Muslim, like who just going to the deen, he realizes there's all these issues, but the real issue becomes like, where do you start? You know what I mean? What would you advise to that little child? Keep it simple. Start with what you can. Start with what's in front of you. Don't worry about what's coming and what's around the corner and what's around the bend. Just take every day as it comes and start learning your basics, start learning your fundamentals. Because, you know, when you've got the basics and the fundamentals, then everything can, everything feeds off that. You know, so when you know the basics of your deen, the basics of your Lord, the basics of the Quran and the Sunnah and what it means, and I'm saying real basics, then all knowledge can be built on that. You know, all manners can be built on that. All loving can be built on that. Forgiving, you know, loyalty. Everything builds off that. But when you don't have the foundation correct, that's when you get lost in the world. You know, that's when your businesses don't go well. Your marriages don't work out. Your because the core isn't correct. So, for instance, you you mentioned about your background and uh, how science and the theory of evolution. And you know, I was in the um, I was in New Zealand recently. And I had a number of uni students come to me to talk to me and, you know, look, can I pull you aside to speak to you? So I was like, yeah. And I'm not joking, 98% of them all had the same question for me. And basically, they were questioning the existence of God. And these are Muslims, born Muslims, raised Muslims who, you know, and I found, and all of them went to uni. So I'm thinking, what's the link here? See, because when you don't have the foundations of your deen, then no matter where you go, there's a fitna for you. So these, you know, so these guys and girls are going to unis and they're going wherever it is that they're going and they're learning new things, they're seeing new things, things that they didn't know before. Now, when you when your foundation in your deen isn't correct, it can shake you. Whereas when you know the asal of your deen, when you know the you know the 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 fundamentals of your faith, then when you go to uni or you go to a school or you go to a new job or whatever the case may be, it won't shake you. It it it, it won't knock you off your feet, you know, because that's what it's built on. So I'll give you like a small example. When you know your faith and you know the fundamentals of your deen, then when you go to study science, everything you learn will only make you glorify Allah more and more. Because you know who's behind everything. But when you don't have that, and now you're learning of people that are non-Muslims, and you know, and 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 now they're pushing and they're questioning, and they, you know, it can really shake you off your feet. That's um, pretty profound point you bring up in terms of you know knowing your deen or the fundamentals, because even I guess Muslims that are born Muslim, they go into uni. If you ask them, you know. Who is Allah? Describe to me Allah. 
they don't know what to say. Like they'll say they'll think of you know the Christianized version of God, like oh he's some God man in the sky. But you know our qida is so um, profound. If you just study, I guess the history and you know all just about Allah in described in Islam, you know outside time and space, all these fundamentals. It makes you realize that you know there's so much wisdom in the deen that gets overlooked by just you know it also reminds me of a story that that uh, i'm sure i've mentioned it on the podcast before but uh, fakhruddin razi was introduced to a woman the great theologian fakhruddin razi and he was introduced to an old lady and and they introduced him as the man who knows a thousand proofs for allah and uh, the old lady said if he if he didn't have a thousand doubts why does he need a thousand proofs and fakhruddin razi made die he said may allah give us all the faith of old ladies and so I think that, that there's something very profound in that, in, in that in, in knowing your, your deen, in knowing your like the, the amal, the practice of your deen and making you know really, really trying to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in your in your daily in your daily practice, in your daily life, and whatever it may be, then everything else falls into place around that and nothing else from outside can bother can really Interfere with and bother you if you're if you're set in that practice, and I think that's that's a very profound point. Um, in terms of um, the direction we mentioned before, we're talking about direction of the, um, the Muslim community, because you've travelled you know around the world, you've experienced different communities. I assume. So, where do you think um, the Sydney community sits in regards to the rest of the world? Is there everyone kind of the whole ummah on the same boat, sort of thing, or are we follow? Are we I think I think our problems are universal. Our problems are universal. In general, I believe Sydney is ahead of the game. As far as Dean and Dawa, Sydney is I mean, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. As far as my Dean is concerned, there's so much happening in Sydney. Alhamdulillah, we're very fortunate. Yeah, what would you say the main are. kind of Universal issues are though facing the Muslim community. Honestly, it's all the same. Lack of faith, doubting God's existence, um, insecurities, uh, love of dunya, wealth, uh, fame, money. You know, <laughs> where do you they're literally stop all the issues know? identified. But you, like, know. Um, you know, but um, I mean, that, that's you know, lost identities. Um, you know. We're all, there's just so much. Wallahi, so much. Our problems are so much. Uh, and 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 they're universal. You know, like, yeah. I don't know how deep you want to go, but. As deep as you, you know, you'd like to, but. Yeah, like I, I, you know, we look at our problems as Muslims and we say, you know, Muslims have problems. You know, over the last year, I see, uh, I don't know, I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is it from Allah, I don't know, but I feel like my heart is, I feel like our problems are way beyond Muslims. I think humanity as a whole is suffering. You know, humanity as a whole is suffering. Do you think generally human society has just declined? I feel like we're declining rapidly. Wallahi, just, and it's sad. It's, it's, it's very, very sad. It's very unfortunate. Because we have the medicine, we have the recipe, we have the solution, we know. But who's there to, you know, who's there to fulfill it? Who's there to uplift this deen? Who's there to, sh you know, spread this message and, and, you know, and actually live by it? Very, very few of us, you know. So we, and, you know, depending on where I am, different circles, I feel like, I feel like everyone's missing the elephant in the room, you know, and everyone's concerned about what's happening with them, you know, that Muslims are under attack or, you know, it's the media that's against us or, 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 or you know, look, uh, uh, you know, for some people, his biggest problem is the fact that his masjid is, is you know, for other people, it's like their little organization and, and you know, for some, and it's like, bro, you've, the whole world is suffering. The world is suffering. Humanity as a whole is declining rapidly. And you're worried about what the, you know, so it's just, there's an attack on not just Islam, but religions as a whole, all faiths. The concept of faith is being attacked, it's being destroyed, annihilated, you know, values. 
being attacked. And what values are there to replace those values that yeah. they're attacking? And I think what, what is, exactly, you know, like, I mean, you know, like if you were to ask me a year ago, I would have said to you, yeah, that, you know, it's us against them. You know, Muslims against the rest of the world. Now I look at it as in anyone who believes in God is under attack. Anyone who has any sort of faith, Abrahamic faith, where he's hanging on to some values, you know, in a world that's gone mad, <laughs> you know, he's he's under attack. You know, it's belittled, it's ridiculed, it's made fun of. Um, more and more people are hiding their belief in God, being more and more ashamed of their faith. You know, so for me, I don't just look at it from a Muslim perspective. Like I look at it as a whole and I think, what's happening? You know, like I, I just, sorry, like I, I know I'm jumping around. But you know how when we were saying about um, that when your faith in God is strong, then everything else can build off it. You know, sometimes I'll be watching a very unique documentary and it's they're coming up with amazing stuff. You know, and you listen to the narrator and he's blown away with the facts of a, you know, it could be an insect or a creature or so, you know, and he speaks about the unbelievable you know, the system and how it works and how things are coming together. And it's got Allah all over it, you know, and it's, you know, and he's speaking like almost like this is, this is a miracle upon a miracle. And then at the end of it all, he'll say, you know, and this is how Mother Nature wanted it. <laughs> and I just, Allah, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, like forget from a Muslim's perspective. How can you be in awe of such a system or a creature or a, you know, and you've spoken about it in depth. And then at the end of it all, he wraps it up with, you know, he wraps it up with, and that's how Mother Nature, who, what is Mother Nature? Like, who, who is this? But, you know, had I said God, I'm backwards. You know, I'm backwards. But he says Mother Nature and everyone's, oh, wow, that's amazing. Wallahi, it shocks me every time. He hits me so hard, you know. That, you know, they'll be looking at intricate details of, of, you know, amazing science research. And they're blown away and things that they can't explain and they know they can't explain it, right? And they're mesmerized with the mathematics and the this and the that. And and then at the end, and this is how Mother Nature wanted it. And wallahi, sometimes, you know, like I scratch and I look around and I think. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm the one that's hiding my faith in God. That's backwards. <laughs> you just went through a whole one hour documentary speaking about things that you, you know, humans and scientists, the most advanced researchers can't, you know. But that's how <laughs> it's just, I find it interesting, you know. And I think, Allah, and it's so sad, you know. And, and, but yeah, I think, I think, I think all religions are under attack. Abrahamic religions altogether are being attacked and the belief in God and the values, values, values. It's like that big elephant in the room that I guess the rest of society is missing out on. Yeah, absolutely. I came from that very society of, you know, being the attacker. I was one of those people. I was one of I was like a strong atheist die if you if you like, oh. you know. And atheist uh, die. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I came from that background and I think what really struck me and what turned me away from that life was that one how i felt inside two you you kind of reach a point where you're like but there's there's nothing to this and then when you when you feel that there's nothing to this in 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 the kind of vision you have for for life and what you believe life is then there's nothing to yourself um, maybe that wouldn't make sense to everyone, no, that's but it deep. makes sense to me. Makes sense. And oh. I was my whole <laughs> life was there, you know, disputing these ideas of God. I thought the idea of God was backwards, and I'd go to all my friends. I went to a Catholic school, and I'd be like, "How can you believe in this? How can you believe in this?" And I suppose when when I one day I, it, it struck me, it was actually from a one path video. I came out, no, no, not a one path video. I came a Saleh video. I talk about it a lot, and he was talking. Uh, in response to an atheist video I've talked about on my podcast before but just the way he was speaking was filled with something that I didn't understand and that was beauty and that was um, a richness and a passion and and when I started to study Islam I found that and I hadn't found that in anything else and I think that 
what we're talking about is the decline of human civilization. And I think that part of that decline in human civilization is because all of that richness, all of that beauty um, is being lost. And what's replacing it is this vapid culture of, of you know, basically just... <laughs> There's there's no values that are fixed anymore. Everything is changing. It's it's a brutal, cruel, angry, bitter world. It's that a we're selfish world. It's it all is. about me. You know, it's all about me. You know, as long as I'm happy. You know, and 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 Subhanallah, like you find, Deen is the exact opposite. Deen is never about you. It's always about Allah and others, helping others, assisting others. Being at the aid of others, you know, uh, 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 thanking Allah, knowing that whatever you have never came from you. There's, I don't know, like, I feel like there's this obsession with the me, I, you know, and uh, like, well, I, I, again, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's like, it's just what a lonely world, man. It's all about me, you know, and no matter who gets hurt and no matter what damage is done. And it's like, I feel like everyone is on this quest. You know, like we're all on this big search. You know, i got to find my way. You know, it's just like the, the, you know, it's just like the guy who, you know, it's just like the narrator in the documentary at the end of, you know, this is how Mother Nature wanted it. You know, so now I've got these people who, who, who don't want God, don't want faith, don't want, and that's fine. Well, like, genuinely, and I really mean that. That's your business, you know. But then what are you filling it up with? So now everyone's on a quest. You know, I've got to find my way. And I'm thinking, your way to what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what, you know, on your way to what? You know, I can't remember what it was. Well, I can't remember if it was a movie or something. But I remember, so it was like a bit of a comedy. And then one guy said to the other, you know, he said to him, have you found Jesus? And the guy goes, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him. <laughs> you, know, what, what, <laughs> you know, like, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him. What, what's, so it's just, and, you know, like, I, I, I find this, you know, subhanAllah, I, I was, I was um, so, something I heard once in a debate between a Muslim and an atheist. And the Muslim, he said something very, very unique. He said one of the saddest things about being an atheist is, when you reach the pinnacle of your life, who do you have to thank? No one. No. That reminds me, because um, we had um, a fellow brother in the cave get married recently, and I was at um, Sheikh Bilal Danun. He was like facilitating the whole kind of marriage, and what happened was that I think it was a quote from the Quran. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he said that. Um, the fact with you know male and women get married um, and you know uh, two lovers come together and obviously through a halal way through a halal marriage but he said that um, Sheikh Bilal said that it's not just the fact that they fell in love and they came together that and they got married it's the fact that Allah brought them two together through love you know even to that level we're actually still thanking Allah it, it's been it, it's subhanAllah if you really contemplate the fact that you know love and when you get married in a halal way, it's Allah who brings you together. So you're still thanking Allah in that process. So as, as you mentioned that it, what's an atheist, they it, it's like they don't have much to go by essentially. Yeah, well, I mean who who do you who do you think? Who do you think? You know, it's all about me. Yeah, and th- and that's I mean, in a whole I see this godless society. You know, that's all about me, it's all about you, it's all about, you know, you being... And it's very, very unfortunate. And for a Muslim, you know, it's the exact opposite. For the Muslim, he knows that no matter what they have, that that didn't come from them. Be it your knowledge, your strength, your money, your might, your power, your connections, your family, your good looks. Anything you have as a genuine believer, you know that all thanks is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever good I have, that's from Allah, and whatever bad or evil, then that's from my own doings. Even um, what if, for example, we have you know non-Muslims listening to the podcast and they're hearing what you're saying, but their kind of counter argument would be, 
no, look, we have technology. Look, um, we have a lot of, I don't know, charities that are out there. Look, I, I donate. Look, um, we've improved um, lives. Um, We're vegans. You know, vegans, <laughs> yeah, that's very important as well. Alhamdulillah. And, you know, we've done all this medicine and we're helping people and, you know, medical centers and hospitals and we've done all this stuff. So, I don't know what you're exactly relating to. What would your response be to someone like that? I mean, I don't see where the clash is. Humans have always aspired to be the best that they can throughout the ages. So, I don't see why. I mean, yes, we've advanced technologically. I think no one can deny that. Are we doing great things? Like, I mean, do we have great services? Yes. But honestly, in your heart of hearts, do you feel deep down in your heart, as human beings, morally, are we moving forward or are we going backwards? You know, I lived in a time where we didn't have great advancements. Like when I was young, right? What's that? The late 80s, Okay. And we, I mean, mum and dad were very simple people, very simple upbringing. But I caught the very last of it. You know, Allah, I say this more and more lately. I remember growing up, we used to put money in an envelope. We lived in a block of units. We used to put money in a yellow envelope. We used to leave it outside on the door. We used to close the door. We'd wake up in the morning and there would be milk bottles there. Can we do that today? My the, grandmother talks about that. Like there said. wasn't a single security camera. There wasn't a single nothing. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Not a lock on a door. Nothing. We could put money in an envelope with full... It, it wasn't... The thought of it being stolen wouldn't even cross your mind. Like, it, it's just... No way. And we used to do that. And I'm not talking about some weird... Pl- I'm talking about Sydney, Australia, here in, you know, in the backyard... Right, we used to leave money in an envelope, go to sleep, and in the morning, guess what was there? Two fresh bottles of milk. Could we do that now with all of our advancements? Well, you know, my, yeah, my grandmother is obviously a migrant from the Mediterranean area as well. So she always talks about how back in the day they'd leave the front door open and yeah. the kids would play in the street. And she's like, I'd never do that now. If I was a mother back coming here now, I would never do that. So... Look, all advancements are good, but not when they come at the cost of the morals and integrity and the value of the human being, man. It goes back to the me, me, me thing. So it relates to your story. Honestly, when was the last time you had a genuine conversation with someone without looking at your phone? Honestly, I challenge you to come up with something. I can't even say now. I just... (laughs) (laughs) Right? When? When? Um, me so, personally, you know, like, like, yes, we are advancing, but at what cost? At what cost? I can't sit with my kid for three minutes without looking at my phone. So, yeah, have we moved forward technologically? Yes. Again, at what cost? What are we all look? You know, sometimes I look at the world and I find it very interesting, right? And Going back to, you know, this godless society and God is backwards, fine. But then every action of human is crying out for God. <laughs> Do you see that? Or, or, or honestly, am I an alien? I see it everywhere in society, you know. You know, I feel like humanity is crying out for help. And it's like no one can hear it, you know. No one hears the cry. Are you making reference indirectly to, for example, you know, non-Muslims, um, I don't know, partying, drinking? It's Muslims, normal. Muslims, Muslims more than the non-Muslims. But yeah, exactly. Going out, partying and, you know, there's this, I want to relieve myself. I want to have fun, right? Great. But then what? But then what? You know, sometimes I see people coming home after a party you seen how bugger they are? They're so drained and it's like they're dragging themselves back home, coming back to reality, you know. It's well, I feel like we're living a life where no one wants to face the music. No one wants to take the bull by the horns. It's just covering up, cover, you know, cover-ups, cover-ups. We're all wearing masks. You know, we're all wearing masks. 
it it's if it's like me me about me it, like for example you talked about you know essentially they want to fill that void but what's the end goal you know they just want to be happy they might as well you know sit in a chair fire some dopamines in their brain feel happy and that's pretty much the reason for their existence yeah, but i'm saying even wallah even with that i'm telling you now between us three let's come up with a definition of happiness from like yeah, yeah but uh, like See, already there, there's a clash in your mind. Okay, are we going to speak from a Muslim perspective? <laughs> are we going to speak about uh, happiness, happiness? Apparently, everyone is chasing happiness. We all want to be happy and we all want to be free. And, we, you know, like, they, you know, and you get these slogans thrown at you all the time that I want to be free. What is freedom? Who defines freedom? You know, it's, it's I feel like we're chasing a unicorn that doesn't actually exist. Unicorns. Yeah, it's a unicorn. We're chasing unicorns. This happiness. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't even define it. I don't even know what it is. What is happiness? You know, and wallahi, I mean, you know, we don't have much time, but you know, like, you can get into it through anything and everything. You know, like I see two people getting married, glitter in their eyes, and you know, this is gonna last forever, and then three weeks later, it's over. Where did all the love go? Where where did all the, you know, no one, like, what are you chasing? What are you after? Let's first define it. Let's first, you know, draw a picture so we all know what we're looking for. But you don't know what, like, you know, and, and it's just, I feel like we're just, we're all over the place, man. We're all over the place. Do you feel like one of the main issues obviously facing the whole world is like the rise of mental health? Yeah, problems, not the rise of mental health, but the rise of mental health issues. And now uh, suicide is a leading, leading cause, of, cause of death for men under the age of 40. And that that's also in the Muslim community. It's yeah, of course. There as well. So do you think that this kind of chasing of this false happiness is one of the main reasons yeah. for, the, for the decline? Of Absolutely. I mean, going going back to what you were saying to me about um, about yeah. advancements. Yeah. And when I was saying to you, you know, every action of society is like a, it's a cry for help with all of our advancements, right? With all of our tech. Look at it as a, is domestic violence, is that on the rise or not? Yeah. Drug abuse, is that on the rise or not? Yeah. Insecurities, anxiety, is that on the rise or not? Yeah. Suicide, is that on the rise or not? Yeah. You know, <laughs> family problems, are they on the rise or not? Divorces are they on the you know and and the, uh, uh, like honestly is this a sign of progress or are we going backwards man and again like it's a cry for help it's a cry for help what would you um, because you're touching on happiness before um, defining happiness so how would you define happiness look uh, uh, again like I don't want this to be about me yeah. but I know from a Muslim's perspective. Look what, you know what makes things very easy for me is that Allah and His Prophet have told me everything that I need to know. Allah didn't leave it to me to chase around and come up with a definition of happiness. Allah did that for me. You know, He sent me a prophet who showed me the path, told me about life and told me about myself and gave me the formula. You know, everyone's trying to reinvent the wheel and we always come back to the same destination, you know. Um, so, you know, chasing happiness. Allah has told me what happiness is. Allah has told me where I can find contentment. Allah has told, you know, like all of these things have been shown to me. Success. Every human being wants to be successful. There's not a human being on earth, no matter where they come from, except that there's a there's a natural instinct in them there's a quest to be successful right what is success ultimate success allah says and whoever enters paradise then this is the greatest success of all and that's life you know so and yeah that that's so for me deen has made it easy you know one of I'll tell you how my deen has made my life simple. 
I'll share this with you guys. I know we don't have much time, but I'll share this with you. One of the things about Islam that has really given me a big boost in life is that Allah in the Quran has told me about myself. And when you hear it and you learn it and you embrace it, life becomes so much different. For instance, Allah says in the Quran, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانَ ضَعِيفَ The human being was created weak. As soon as I read that and I heard it and, 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 and I embraced it, I stopped trying to be strong <laughs> and just embraced the fact that I'm weak and that I need Allah. And when you embrace it, and I don't mean weak as in you give up on life, no, that's, that's not what I mean, right? But this, 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 and honestly, just go look at the Lebanese community. Just go and look at our young boys. Everyone's trying to be what? Everyone wants to be tough and strong. And Habibi, where are you, where are you going? You're weak, whether you like it or not. Allah created you weak. When do you become strong? You're strong when you're with Allah. Because he's all strength. So when I'm with all strength, I become strong. But so long as I'm not with all strength, no matter what you do and what you're taking, you will never be strong. Allah says the human being by nature, the human being is ignorant, he's a fool. When do I become knowledgeable? When do I become wise? Only when I'm with Allah. Going back to the narrator who speaks for two hours about the most amazing scientific, only, wallahi, knowledge upon knowledge. And how does he wrap it up? And this is how Mother Nature wanted it. Where did, the, like, you know, so when is the human actually, when they're with Allah? Allah says, you were, you're poor. The human is, the human is, we're nothing. We're only something when we're with Allah. So for me, you know, knowing this about me, well, it's made my life so much easier, man. I feel like I don't need, the, like, I don't have this need. I don't have this pressure in trying to impress or trying. Who are you impressing, bro? Who? <laughs> Whatever you have, Allah gave it to you. <laughs> you were nothing before. And soon you will die. And, you know, everything in between is... I think that's our cue, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. Audience will probably hear in the background with that I'm going, but I guess um, just to kind of final thoughts. I think that was a really kind of deep episode in regards to touching on, you know, a lot. I guess science, the world around us, problems. But I think a lot of people, inshallah, will benefit from it. I think it was more of a enlightening, emotional episode um, to really get through just the basic essence of a human being because we get we get. We neglect it from time to time. We overlook just the simple things in life. You know, we talk about too much about technology, but don't realize, you know, the very simple issues that exist at the moment. But uh, regardless, Jazakallah khair, um, brother Muhammad Hoblos for coming on Boys in the Cave. Really enjoyed this um, discussion episode. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've actually learned a few things. So. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Me too, definitely. And plenty and, to uh, take home and and to the brothers and the sisters that are out there, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, I ask Allah to guide one and all. You know, we've chased everything in this world and, and nothing's giving us satisfaction. <laughs> How much longer will we deny Allah? How much longer will we... Allah loves you and He's waiting. I don't understand why we keep delaying. And I guess it's limited time as well. The clock's ticking. Yeah. Everyone's gonna die eventually. Death is is a, is a reality. And um, like Ali bin Abi Talib said, it's it's coming towards you fast. And the dunya is is going that way. It's behind you. And death is coming towards you. So well, you can't chase the dunya, but you have to face death. And how long are people going to distract themselves with? the world around them so 
we'll wrap it up there inshallah so for our listeners thank you for giving us your attention if you have any questions or comments feel free to email us at info at boys in the cave.com or find us on facebook and you can follow our journey through instagram please leave a five star rating on itunes as that greatly helps us um inshallah you can support us through patreon um patreon.com slash boys in the cave the many tires you know a dollar a month five dollars a month inshallah you can definitely take a pick and you can also upgrade to higher tires so you can ask questions to our guests so from